So let's have a look at what tiering means, how you get started, what we can do uh, if you're already experienced and started with tiering, how can you move to the next level? What's, what is the next level basically? So I have a prepped demo environment. I have a blank DC or semi-blank DC. I have some random OUs that we're gonna look at. They don't contain anything right now, but they are a visual representation of how your environment may look. You have uh, servers, you have workstations and users and things like that. As part of tiering, we need to consolidate everything and make sure that we have good organization for everything so we can apply specific rule sets and define where everything goes and who can access everything. Now, remember the access we're talking about here is administrative access. It's not normal user access that needs to access a system to, to do invoicing or whatever it may be. This is purely administrators doing administrative work and, and remote access, basically. So if we switch over to my screen quickly, this is a normal Active Directory. There's nothing fancy. It's a very simple setup. We have an OU for servers. We may have an OU for, for workstations here. And in this demo environment, they don't contain anything. In your real environment, these will contain anywhere from two PCs to 200 PCs or 20,000 PCs. It doesn't really matter. It's just about you have OUs today. And the way we're going to do this is I'm going to showcase a PowerShell script to build everything out. And the reason we use PowerShell is because there's a lot of different parts that needs to be built. So we've compiled the script. Um, and if we just check at the bottom, you can quickly see that it's 980 something rows. It's a pretty big script. It does a lot of things. And among the things that we are doing here is that we are creating OUs. We create a new structure for your theory. We create setups uh, and configuration for laps if you use laps. And if you don't, you need to start using laps. We also do uh, privileged access workstations. We do normal users and uh, user access and groups and, and things like that. And if we scroll down, there's also a switch in here, which we use an incident response called minimal. And we're not going to do minimal today. We're going to do the full blown big thing here today. But minimal is something that we use during incident response to make sure that when we get to a customer that's had a fire, everything is chaos. Everyone's using domain admin everywhere and it's all horrible and we don't want that. So then we use this script in a minimal fashion to create a very, very basic tiering that protects domain admins and nothing else to ensure that if a threat actor were to come in, we can at least limit the damage. So it's pretty straightforward to run. You can run it as is. You don't need to, the only thing that you need, need to specify is the company name. What do you want your company to be called? And it doesn't necessarily need to match your actual company name. This is going to be the name of an OU. So don't worry too much about it. If it's wrong, you can remove the OU and recreate it if needed. So I have prepared a one-liner. I'm in the folder where I have the script. So I will run the script with a company name, fixtures company name in this case. I will create an admin OU name. I will specify how many tiers I have. Now, we need to talk about a bit about how many tiers you're gonna have. In normal circumstances, you will most likely have two. Two is more than enough for most people. If you have a bigger environment and if you've already started doing this, this can be increased to add more tiers to add complexity, but reduce risk. So it is a risk versus complexity argument here. I'm going to skip laps, the skip lap setup in this demo environment because I will already have laps in this demo environment. So there will be some overlay if I do. So let's see if this works the way it's supposed to. Run the line. Uh, so right now the script is creating all the tiers. It's creating tier zero, tier one, tier two. And it's also going to create the uh, tier endpoint if I'm not mistaken, which will show up in a second. It's created the GPOs. It has done what's called computer redirection. So by default, when we talk about computer redirection, it's when you add a computer object to Active Directory. If you take your device, you go into settings and you join a domain. The computer object will com be created in the computer's container in Active Directory. Now the downside of this is that you can't apply direct policies to that container. 
it's just not possible technically. So what we do is we use a, a tool called CMP redu uh, redirect CMP, which gives us the ability to say when a user joins the domain and no one's done anything or specified where it should end up, it will end up in the U OU you specify instead. Now this means that we can have an OU, maybe we call it computer quarantine or you can call it on the managed devices or something. We can create policies that define that this should become managed. We can also define that they should be when they log in, they should be greeted with a pop-up message saying, your device is incorrectly configured for this domain. Please reach out to your system admin to get assistance and things of that nature. And this created the GPOs. So while it's building my tiers and it's also building my demo tier, um, we'll have a look at some of the group policies that it's created. I'll do a quick refresh here to be sure we have all of them. So as you can see, it's built a bunch of... Um, group policies. And these are all policies that define who can connect where. So if we take up, um, if we bring up restrict admin logons, it's already linked to the correct. Uh, so if we check here, we can see that it's this policy here, restrict admin logons to T1. It's already linked to the T1 OUs. And if we go back quickly, it's going to be applied to everybody who has access to that OU, which means as soon as you put a server and a user in that OU, they will get the correct access. So this simplifies things. Now, while the other things are building, I will show you something. I have security settings on. As you can see here in the policies that it's built, they're all empty. And it's the same for all of the policies that are currently built. This script does not build policies with settings in them. It only builds the actual policy and links it to the correct OU. So once this is done, which it is now, see, it says done, we have another script, okay? So we'll scroll down and I'll show you. This takes no parameters at all, as you can see here. And it then figures out where you're running from. And then it does get AD objects. It gets the domain, it gets the users, it gets the groups, and it filters for SID IDs. And this is to map the policy that we have pre-created that contains information with the correct domain information because we want them to be mapped to your domain. So it's, so it's mapping correctly. We have a small folder with a zip file in called GPO backup, you can see here. It's about 400 kilobytes in size, it's not a big one, it contains all of the policies we have, they're extracted from a, from a temporary domain that we have, that we build this in. And then we go here, we go back, we create a new line and we do import TSX, TSX GPO and we run it, which will expand the archive. So it's not fast enough to do. And if you're very, very quick at reading, you will see that it builds all of the, or imports all of the information into the GPOs. This, the naming of these match the exact naming that are built for each and every one of the GPOs that are already in the main. It also verifies and only imports the policies that you actually have in the domain. So if there is no policy, you won't actually import it. So if we go back to our domain, we do a refresh, you can now see there's a bunch of security information in here. And this defines who cannot log on, basically. You cannot log on if you are part of this group or that group. You cannot run batch job if you're a part of this group or that group. And it's basically blocking all of, all of the settings that you have. With this, together with the OUs that we built. So if we go back to our domain and we do a quick refresh, we are going to see that we now have a bunch of extra OUs. So we have the admin OU that we created. We also have the via Monstra OU that we created, the company name that I picked. And you can see we get endpoints and users and we get all the tiers. And if we expand one of the tiers, this, you see we have 
OUs for servers and service accounts and groups and everything that is mapped to each and every one of the tiers. So this means that we can now start putting things in the correct tiers, which will also apply all the security policies needed for that specific tier, ensuring that if you have a computer that's a member of tier zero, only tier zero admins will be able to log on to it. This is a very, very powerful yet simple tool to use. This is how AD was supposed to be done years and years ago. Microsoft did white papers on how to build this out and how to, to ensure that you had this structure. And yet for some reason, people opted to not do this and instead do a mirror of the actual organizational structure the company has, which can be useful. It's not that but it's not what AD was meant for. AD has always been meant as a security container, basically. Now, this gives us somewhere to put everything. Now the heavy lifting starts for you as an organization. You have to move all the servers into the correct tier. Moving a server in AD is not something I'm gonna cover. I'm pretty sure you all know how to right click and move. However, once you have done this, there's going to be groups in here that define where you belong. So if you put a user into tier one, tier zero groups or tier one groups, that dictates how they are given permissions. And it's important to see that I'm currently in tier zero, which means I can see all of the admins but if you are in tier one, you will never be able to see tier zero admins. If you're in tier two, you will not be able to see tier one or tier zero admins. So you can never give yourself more permissions than you already have. So keep that in mind. We have people, we have organizations who have circumvented this and that breaks the entire tiering concept. So it's important that you keep this structure as is to make sure that you only give permission to the relevant people. And Last, if you already have this, how do you move on from this? So we are going to need a different tool. I'm going to show this visually because um, it's easier for people to, to understand. And it's called authentication policies and authentication silos. So the, the way the tiering works is we've built group policies that we looked at we built OUs that we looked at in groups, which define that you cannot auth uh, log in, but you can still do an authentication towards that target. However, with authentication silos and authentication policies, we can go a step further and tell the domain controller that a user and a computer together needs to be a specific combination to be even allowed to do the authentication. The way this works and the, the, the script that we have already builds all of this out. So you get policies and if we go back one step, we also get predefined silos. Now, when the script builds this, this is empty. It's not enforced, so it's, it's all empty. So you can safely build this and then move on from there. But what you need to do is you need to put users and computers in here. This is when we start to talk about privileged access workstations or privileged jump stations, if that's the route that you're taking as a middle ground. So what you do is you put in the user, let's say we have Bob who's an admin and Bob needs to be part of the authentication silo. He is a domain uh, admin. So we put in Bob, but we also need to put in the computers that Bob is allowed to log in from. So it's very important that you keep this tight and, and ensure that you have both sides of the story here. And that's where privileged access workstations really tie in. So you can have those dedicated machines for users that are high privileged users that you need to take control of. This is very, very powerful. There is basically no way of, of circumventing this. So it becomes a very strict thing. And here's where we need to think about Again, privileged access workstations. How do you deliver those? Where are they available? Who can access them? Who have them? How do you build them? And so on and so on and so on. And I think that's about it for the demo. Uh, I hope you put a lot of questions in. I we really love questions. And any questions you did put in, we'll answer right after this when we go back to the sofa.
So, Frederick, what do you think? 